Watch out. It's a racket. Thousands of ruthless, vicious jip artists are just waiting for a chance at your money. They're smooth. Their schemes sound like easy money. They know their filthy business. Your only protection is vigilance. And to show you what to watch out for, the American Broadcasting Company presents It's a Racket, with Frank Graham exposing the methods by which the tricksters, crooks, and confidence men take their annual toll of honest capital and savings. Listen, learn, and watch out. It's a racket. Here's Frank Graham. When rancher Henry Forsyth stepped into his Cheyenne bank to put his $8,000 worth of Alaska tungsten mine stock into his safety deposit box, he couldn't help but talk to the bank manager, his friend Alfred Drew, and tell him what a killing he'd made. Killing? I'm sorry to say, Henry, those stocks are worthless. Worthless? Sure. I don't know where you got them, but there's no such thing as the Alaska tungsten mine. The FBI's been after those racketeers for a month. You've been taken for a ride. Behind those simple words, you've been taken for a ride, lies a fabulous story of the cunning of the professional racketeer. The almost unbelievable story of the Alaska tungsten mine swindle, which I'll tell you in a moment. This is a tip on an investment. The most profitable investment a person can make today. And anybody can make it. It doesn't call for hundreds or thousands of dollars. What it calls for primarily is common sense and an appreciation on the part of the investor that a return of $4 for three is a pretty good deal. That's why United States E-Class Savings Bonds pay at maturity $4 for every three you put into them. Take advantage now of the opportunity to buy United States Savings Bonds. They can be purchased at banks or post offices or through the payroll savings plan where you work. Think of your future today and buy United States Savings Bonds. Now here again is Frank Graham. The ranch and desert lands of Wyoming flew by as Henry Forsyth drove his station wagon along the highway. He was driving into Cheyenne from his ranch more than 50 miles out. This was a ride Forsyth took once a week, every Thursday morning, to get his hair cut, do some bank business, and chat a little with the boys down at his club. Forsyth was a rancher, and he had a reputation for being a smart one. Hadn't he built a small and neglected ranch into one of the biggest and best in the county? As the outskirts of the city became visible, he slowed his car down to comply with the speed laws. A few moments later, he was riding down one of the main streets, heading for his barber shop, when suddenly, from between the cars parked along the curb, a man stepped out, right out in front of Henry Forsythe's car. Hey, did you get hurt there? No, no, no. It's, it's quite all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you coming out from behind those cars. Perfectly all right. It's my fault. I guess I was busy looking the town over and didn't watch myself crossing the street. Oh, stranger here? Yes, I was looking for a good barber shop. I need a haircut so badly, well, I... Look... hop in. I'm just going to the barber myself. Right. Yeah. Uh, my name's Buell, Dr. Buell. I'm hoping to start an office in town. Good. You can always use another good doctor. My name's Forsyth, Doc. Henry Forsyth. I've got a ranch out of town away. Maybe I can help you. That's how it began. An accidental meeting on the street. Or so it seemed. But it wasn't accidental to the man who called himself Dr. Buell and whose knowledge of medicine was limited to administering an aspirin for a hangover. No, Dr. Buell was no doctor. And the accident was no accident. For Buell knew that Forsyth came to town every Thursday to get a haircut. After an hour at the barber shop, two men were friends. They'd uh, talked about their families and their various business problems, and had made a date to meet the following Thursday for lunch. The two men shook hands and parted. Forsyth to go about his business, firm in the belief that he'd made a new friend. Dr. Buell, back to his hotel, smiling inwardly at the knowledge that by this simple, seemingly innocent maneuver, he had taken the first step in his operation to fleece Henry Forsythe. The week went by rapidly, and on the appointed day at lunchtime, Dr. Buell and Henry Forsythe met as they had planned. They shook hands warmly and walked into a restaurant to get their lunch and discuss Buell's problem of opening his office. But as they sat down at their table, something very strange happened. Something very peculiar indeed. Hey, what's the trouble, Henry? I don't know. There's something on my chest. Let's see. Well, I'll be. It's a wallet. A wallet? Yes. 
Someone must have lost it. Say, look at this money. Whoever lost it is certainly a rich man. What about a name? Identification? Now, there's a letter here. Look at this letter here, will you? Hmm? The Department of the Interior of the United States of America to Mr. George Clark Tryon Hotel. From the Secretary of the Interior. Confidential. From the Secretary himself? What's it about? Let's see. Seems to be about a new tungsten mine. Yeah, in Alaska. You better not read anymore, Henry. It says confidential. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Well, at least we got the fellow's name and where he's staying. Come on, we better get this wallet to him. As the two men left the restaurant and headed down the street for the Cheyenne Hotel, Forsythe's mind was spinning. From the few sentences he'd read in that uh, confidential letter to George Clark from the Department of the Interior. The confidential letter which talked about a big strike in a new tungsten mine in Alaska. Uh, being a businessman, Forsythe knew what a thing like this could mean. He knew how a new vein of ore could bring up the value of a mine. He knew that money would be needed to further explore the resources of the mine. He knew the value of tungsten and that stocks would be sold by the mine operators. Even as he walked through the traffic, Henry was walking in another world. At the Cheyenne Hotel, inside room 312, Mr. George Clark, tall, good-looking man with ruddy cheeks, the executive type, had been peering out the window. Through the curtains, he'd seen Forsyth and Buell come hastily across the street and into his hotel lobby. <laughs> the fish had been hooked, he thought to himself. He turned from the window in a quick movement, uh, loosened his tie, lighted a cigarette, and prepared to play the worried man just as the door buzzer rang. Clark waited for the buzzer to ring a second time. And then in three quick steps, he went to the door and flung it open. Yes? Mr. Clark? Yes? Uh, Dr. Buell here and I found something that belongs hey, to you. My wallet? Here. Yeah. Thank heavens. Man, I've been looking all over creation for that thing. Here, come in, come in, both of you. Please. We knew right away that you'd be worried about it. I can't tell you how worried I've been. Uh, won't you sit down? Well, thank you. Uh, let's see now. It's bad enough to lose the money, but there's a mighty important... Uh, it's here. What a relief. That letter was the only clue to who owned the wallet. I had to read a little of it to find out who you were. Here. Oh, I see. I realize it was a confidential Mr. letter. Mr. Glass, all right. It's all right. I I don't quite know what to do. Oh, there's no need to worry about us. We'll just forget the whole thing. Well, I'm afraid you've stumbled onto something that will be pretty hard to forget. I'll admit this looks like big news in a business way. It is. Don't worry about us, though. Uh, now, look here. I, I'm in a spot. Uh, but I am terribly indebted to you, gentlemen. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Clark. Anyone would have done the same. Yes, I'm not so sure. Well, uh, since you've entered the picture, I, I might as well tell you the whole story. Well, not unless you want to. I think I'd better. The situation is this. A few days ago, there was a new discovery in the Alaska Tungsten Mine. Uh, the news isn't out yet. You see, we've been cooperating with the Department of Interior in keeping it quiet for a few days. Now... Alaska Tungsten has been selling for as low as three cents a share. And it'll continue to sell that cheaply until the news is out. Then the price will skyrocket. Yes, sir, it'll go sky high. To Henry Forsythe, the rancher, the inside story of the tungsten strike in the Alaska Tungsten mine sounded like a fabulous stroke of luck, if he could capitalize on it. Yes, a stroke of luck that happens once in a lifetime. But before the two men left George Clark's apartment, they were sworn to secrecy. Uh, Mr. Clark even went so far as to make a deal with them. A deal whereby he might be able to cut them in for a chance to buy stock in return for their keeping the secret from the public. He uh, praised their business judgment, but pleaded with them to be patient until he could wire the Department of the Interior and get permission for them to buy the stock. That night, Henry Forsythe slept very little. He realized that he was on the threshold of one of the biggest strokes of fortune any man had ever had. The inside news of a fabulous tungsten strike. The inside news and a chance to operate first. A chance to buy stock for as low as three cents a share. A chance to make a fabulous sum of money in the flick of an eyelash. The next day after breakfast, the telephone rang in Forsyth Ranch House. He ran to it and yanked it off the hook. 
Hello? Henry, Dr. Buell. Yes, any news yes. on this? I just talked to Mr. Clark on the telephone. He wants us both to come down with our money. What? Yes, he said the Alaska tungsten stocks are at 10 cents a share and climbing. Well, there must have been a leak someplace. Yeah, but it's still a wonderful chance. And since the stocks are on the open market, he's been authorized to sell us as much as we want. How much are you putting into it? All I've got, Henry, every cent, about 10,000. Well, yeah, I can't do as well as that, but I can go in for 8,000. Well, whatever it is, you better hurry. I told him we'd meet him at his hotel in a couple of hours. Two hours later, Forsyth, Dr. Buell, and George Clark sat around a small table in Clark's hotel room. Spread before them was a telegram from the Department of Interior authorizing Clark to sell some Alaska tungsten stock at 10 cents a share. Spread before them also was the assayer's report on the mine and a bundle of stock certificates. See, ticket, Forsyth. I've already told it to Buell over the phone. You can buy the stock if you want to. I see. Uh, only uh, Dr. Buell made a little mistake when he said you could buy all you want. Uh, you can't. You can only go up to 20000 Well, Dr. Buell wants 10000 and I can handle eight. It's so we're just inside the limit. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, looks like this is your lucky day. Uh, is it a deal? Sure it is, Clark. And believe you me, it's one of the best deals I ever made in my life. Uh, one of the best? Oh, no, Forsyth. The best. When Forsyth walked into his bank the following Monday morning to deposit his stocks in a safety deposit box and to tell the bank manager of the killing he made, he learned the terrible truth. Sorry, Henry, there's no such thing as the Alaska tungsten mine. You've been taken for a ride. Taken for a ride. Yes, Henry Forsyth had been taken for the same merry ride that has been the fate of so many others. The smooth-talking, believable confidence men had baited the trap perfectly. When the banker exposed the racket, it was too late. The phony Dr. Buell and the honest-appearing Mr. Clark were gone. And so was Henry Forsythe's $8,000. Instead of investigating before he invested his money, Henry listened to the build-up and tossed away his savings. It would have been so easy to be sure. He could have followed the lead of thousands who every day consult their better business bureaus, police departments, or their bankers. He forgot the warnings. He tried to get rich in a hurry. And he found out it's a racket. Every day, Monday through Friday, the American Broadcasting Company presents It's a Racket with Frank Graham exposing the methods of the shysters and crooks who yearly take millions of dollars from a gullible public. This program hopes to save much of this money for you who earned it rightfully. Follow these stories closely day by day. Learn how the get-rich-quick schemes and the plausible-sounding rackets operate. Check your own business relations carefully. And remember, before you invest, investigate. The more plausible it sounds and the easier it seems, the more likely you'll find out it's a racket. I'll be back again tomorrow with the inside story of a racket that is right now being worked on unsuspecting veterans. It uh, sounds like a way to get started in business with... Uncle Sam putting up all the money. If you're a veteran, or if you know a veteran, listen to tomorrow's story on... It's a racket! This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>